Welcome to UWO Now. I'm your host, Wendell Ray. UWO Now is the place where we talk with the students, staff, faculty, and alumni of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh about interesting and relevant topics. You know, it was some time ago that we entered the digital age. Not sure exactly when it was. The information age, some call it. Uh, now, while we might not be flying around in George Jetson-type cars, uh, there's no question that technology is important in our lives, the way we use it, the way we interact with it. I mean, think about what would happen if you lost your phone or, God forbid, lost an Internet connection, how you would feel. We're going to talk today with our guest, who is a UWO uh, graduate and was here today uh, talking uh, with uh, uh, groups of people at the Chancellor's Executive Breakfast. That is Janet Tierney, who is uh, a digital strategist, mm -hmm. consultant. Uh, as you mentioned, it kind of depends on what you're doing, but you are, have an expertise in this area of uh, digital strategies and helping companies plot a course, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for coming by and talking to us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Before we get into this complicated world of, of technology and, 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 uh, and how companies position themselves to reach consumers, how we use all of that technology and how we interact, tell us about Janet uh, and who she is and how she got to this seat today. Well, I'm still not exactly sure how I got to this seat today. <laughs> um, I thought for the longest time that I had to know what I needed to be, what I wanted to be when I grew up. And uh, I still haven't figured it out. And I think a while back, I decided I don't need to know what I want to be or who I want to be when I grow up. Not knowing the answer is half the fun. Uh, and I have the best job in the world because I get to solve problems that are solvable. And oftentimes, I have the money and the brain power in the room to be able to really explore some pretty amazing options. Uh, I currently live in Brookfield, Wisconsin after my big move from downtown Milwaukee. So ah. I went from a condo where everything had to come through the building to get to me to now I open the door and nature can walk right in, which has been an interesting adjustment. <laughs> um, I'm married. Uh, I still have a crush on my husband after over 20 years. Nice. So that's that's a great place to be. And I travel extensively. So sometimes he even gets to come along. And you, as I mentioned, uh, graduated from UWO. You uh, attended here. Uh, tell us how you got to UWO. Well, uh, I applied to four colleges. I applied to Purdue. I wanted to study architecture, and Purdue had engineering. And mm -hmm. at the time, Purdue didn't have an application fee, and I was a little broke, so <laughs> Purdue it was. I was going to do engineering, figure out the architecture part later. I applied to Maximilian's University in, um, in Munich because I was fluent in German and because, let's be honest, Oktoberfest sounded like a pretty <laughs> good time. And I applied to the American University of Paris and that was because I've always been really fascinated by the city's architecture. So the architecture theme kind of runs solid through all of that. I see. And I applied to UW Oshkosh, which has no engineering school and no architecture school because I'm from Oshkosh. Oh, and yeah. when it came down to making the decision, this was the, the highest accredited school out of all of those options, believe it or not. And it was also the one that was within my affordability range. And what have you been doing since you graduated from UWL? Well, I, I compare resumes frequently with friends and colleagues. The only more interesting background I found is a guy who was a professional boxer for a while. <laughs> so I think I've, I've, I've spanned the range of human endeavor. I worked for my father, who I'm running an air conditioning and sheet metal company here in, uh, in Oshkosh. I worked for the phone company for a while, so most hated job in America. <laughs> yeah. um, I worked. I went from there to working as a field underwriter for a commercial insurer, spent some time doing underwriting and sales for insurance companies before I just recognized that at some point my career had taken a weird turn. And I went into consulting for nonprofit organizations, wound up working in nonprofits, running nonprofits, um, really getting a sense of Sat personal satisfaction from doing something other than chasing money yeah. just long enough to no longer have enough money to be able to keep doing it. So I went back into chasing money. Uh, I went to finish my MBA, got a job at Pfizer, which is a Fortune 500 company, and um, became successful by being the nicest person in the room, and which is fantastic. Worked with a lot of nice people. But that led to what I do today. Really? Yeah. Now Okay, so you consult, but uh, on a range of topics, or do you have a, 
a narrow focus on the things that you consult? Um, on a range of topics and often not for the reason that I was brought in. So a lot of people will bring me in to talk about digital strategy. How are we leveraging technology for our employees, for our customers? Uh, people will bring me in to talk about agility and how they're working and their various ways of working, not just within IT, but throughout the company. Uh, I get brought in to look at how they're doing their budgeting and their funding model, because in this day and age, we want to have a high confidence that we're focused on the highest value work and that when that information changes, we're able to quickly pivot. So b companies are moving away from an annual budget cycle. So I get into mm. you know, the nitty gritty with the accounting sometimes. But the common thread through all of that is really about how we work together as teammates and how we embrace diversity of thought, diversity of background, um, really bringing all of those I ideas together. We embrace divergent thinking, and then we have all of the tools to bring it back together to come up with a solution. So it's pretty much similar to what I was doing back when I was at UW Oshkosh as part of the Model UN team. You get all the ideas out, and then you bring everyone together to, to agree on what's the best one. Wow, okay. Yeah. So let's talk, though, about uh, one common thread, I guess, in today's uh, business and and just in the, the world in general, and that's technology and how we all interact with it. What are you telling uh, businesses about technology and how they should position themselves from a digital standpoint, reaching consumers, reaching their clients and customers? I challenge, I challenge the people I work with with one simple question, and that is, if you were working for a technology company, do you have the tools and the knowledge necessary to be successful in your role? So if you're a vice president at your company, if you were a vice president of a technology company, do you have the tools and the knowledge you would need to be successful in that environment? And I don't think anyone has ever yet said to me, yes. Hmm. Uh, and then, then the conversation really flows from there. And well, so how do we get you mean? there? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I would imagine that would be what anybody would say who's not in a technology position. So then do they get... Do they panic or do they say, okay, do we need to hire somebody else? So now what? Hopefully, hopefully if they do panic, I catch them before they fall and pass out. Um, people realize that the answer is no. And they realize almost immediately without me asking any other questions, what the gaps are and almost immediately what they need to do to fill them. Um, hopefully they don't get caught in the spiral of, I don't have the tools. I don't have the knowledge. I can't do my job, especially since everything out there is telling me that every company is a technology company. Usually what they are able to jump to is in order to be successful, I am going to need other people who know more than I do. Before I can bring those people in, or maybe while I'm bringing those people in, I'm going to need to be able to admit what I do and don't know. And I'm going to need to be open to other people telling me what I need to know. So building those trust relationships entirely outside of the realm of technology, but still yeah, incredibly vital. And important. And I could imagine that my, may be a struggle for some who are used to being one of the smartest in the room. And all of a sudden they're in a room where they have no clue what's going on. Yeah. Uh, how do they get past that? Well, a lot of what I do is model the behavior. Um, for example, I, I will tell people repeatedly, it costs me nothing to be wrong. In fact, I would rather you tell me right now that I'm wrong because it's cheaper for me to recognize it and change right now than if you tell me tomorrow. So we really need to get ourselves to a point where we're comfortable with that. And I wish that I could say that in every instance, every day, I am comfortable with saying I have no idea what's going on. I don't think that that's true. I think we all struggle with that. But I can also say that I have a lot of fun figuring it out. Um, and as long as I have high confidence in my problem solving ability and the and my ability to have fun while I'm figuring it out, I'm okay. And I try to instill that in others. Hey, this isn't easy. It's not comfortable. And it's not going to be comfortable. Technology is advancing more quickly than we can keep up with it. But find fun in the discomfort. Find the element of play in learning new things and the joy in interacting with other people who are bringing that information to you. Have you found that most companies or uh, in, in uh, agreement with what you're saying when you come in, or there's some who just are just technology resistant? There, there certainly are companies that say, you know, I, I just don't think technology is necessary for what we do. I don't think technology on the scale of what you're talking about is necessary for what we do. 
Uh, and I can usually find some way to help them identify technology is needed in their company by pointing out the technology they expect and then situations where they're not finding it. For example, pre-COVID, um, when you think about it, you could go on Amazon, add all your items to your cart, and it would show up at your doorstep when whatever shipping right. range you were willing to pay for. Um, but if you went to the grocery store, some grocery stores were attempting to have online ordering. The experience was nowhere near as seamless and smooth. So instead of pointing out to people, here's what your business is lacking for your customer, I would point out to them what they as a customer were wanting and lacking in another environment. And it would open the conversation for, yeah, I really wish my grocery store was better at that, or whatever example I'd thrown out for them. And then I would start to kind of push the, well, why don't we talk about how your company could meet the expectations of the Amazon consumer? Because that's what the world is expecting. I know you're not Amazon, but I still want to be able to easily fill my cart and get my stuff within 24 to 72 hours. From a business standpoint, do those businesses, smaller businesses, need to think beyond uh, geographical boundaries uh, that, that they have typically thought of? This is my market. This is my area. I service this county or this state or this region and think more globally. Absolutely. And the, the, you know, I would say the problems that I get the opportunity to help people solve are the most fun problems to have because people often know what the problem, what, what the problem is and defining it as the start, you know, that's, that's the key. They have ideas of how they want to solve it. And then it just becomes really reminding them that they are smart and they already know what this, what the solution is. And it's just a matter of bringing together the people with the expertise to help them get it done. The biggest barrier for small businesses to doing business outside of their immediate geographic area is not technology. Okay. It's regulation. So if I'm selling a candle, for example, and I'm making them in my home in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and I'm starting to get, because I've got a website, I'm starting to get requests to have those candles shipped to Europe. Now I've got to meet all of the requirements for that being defined as a candle, being able to be safely sold as a candle in Europe. The regulation really is a bigger barrier to expanding my reach than the technology is. Wow. So there's uh, another reason to have somebody who's capable of helping you to expand. But let's talk about some of the basic things that I guess any business would need to make sure that they're competitive on a, from a digital standpoint. And you've been in the room with some pretty large uh, companies, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, give me, give us an example of some companies you've worked with. I worked with Nielsen Holdings when they were determining whether or not they were going to continue on as the TV rating system that we're, we're yeah. familiar with here in the U.S. and the marketing service that they offer in Europe. Um, they were trying to figure out whether or not they were going to kind of place their bets on one or the other of those businesses to expand and grow. Okay. Um, that was a lot of fun and a lot of challenges there. I worked with American Express, which was great fun. And thankfully, everything that I worked on now is public knowledge, so we can talk about it. I worked most recently with Visa as another credit card company. I've worked with all of the streaming companies in some capacity. Okay. So sometimes I get to go into companies where, you know, old insurance companies where the technology was built in the 1960s. And sometimes I get to go into companies where the technology is truly cutting edge. Wow. Uh, so you're listening to UWO Now. I'm your host, Wendell Ray. Janet Tierney is with us. She's a UWO grad and also uh, a strategist that helps companies figure out how to best succeed. Let's just say it like that because she strategizes and consults on a number of different levels. We're talking about technology today and how businesses utilize technology to reach consumers and the people that they serve. Uh, and I asked about some of the basic things that I guess a company needs to have. Um, how do you determine where a company is? What do you look at when you go in and, 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 and examine who they are and then figure out what they need in order to get to where they want to be? The most powerful diagnostic tool I have is to ask them where they want to be. Um, most companies, I would, I would hazard to say, no company is happy with what they're doing digitally. Really? Um, really. And that's wonderful from a consumer standpoint because it means that the technology, the services, the, the ease of access that we're going to get tomorrow is, is more than what we even thought to ask for. 
it, as a consumer, it's constantly getting better. And I think as an innovator, it's constantly getting better because, again, it's the most fun problem to solve. We already kind of know what we want to do about it. The money is there. The intelligence is there. It's just a matter of getting the right people together to get it done. Now, what about uh, the companies that you mentioned some pretty large uh, corporations. I would imagine they already have a level of technology. As you said, some of it is cutting edge. What do you say to them? How do you determine where they need to go and what they need in order to get there when they appear to be leading um, in that area? In addition to asking them where they want to go, I ask them questions about how they've how they have achieved the point that they're at. So right now, one of the companies that I'm working with can't say the name, we would consider them to be cutting edge, mm -hmm. be thrilled to have their stock, right? We would, we would, uh, and we would expect them to be delivering, one of the companies delivering the next best thing we never knew we needed, but we absolutely have to have. Um, their big challenge is that like a lot of companies, large, small, forward-looking, legacy, um, they did, they outsourced all of their IT. They grew so quickly that they have almost no one in house who knows how their technology works or who does the work on their technology. That's a significant risk to a company. Yes, it is. So, so the big project there is how do we get that knowledge and expertise inside our walls so that we can continue to improve upon it and, and delight the customer? Okay, good transition. Let's talk about the customer. How important is it to, for customers, for people in general, uh, when they're interacting with uh, companies to have um, that seamless experience with technology and the products or services that an organization or a corporation is delivering? Uh, what's the expectation out there now? So I would say that my expectations and the expectations of others probably aren't the same. Okay. Um, we joke that uh, I have many virtues and patience is not one of them. I don't have the patience to make toast. That sounds like a joke, but it's <laughs> actually true. I have a lot of warm bread in the morning. Um, so I want things to be fast. I want it to be, I want the interaction that I have with that technology to be as dumb as it can be. I, I don't want to have to learn how to interact with my with my uh, products and services that I want to access. I think because my expectations of the technology are very high, I'm probably the person we want in the room saying, mm -hmm. make this better, make this better. I, I still feel pain. Um, but the consumer's expectation truly is what they're getting from the company who is delivering it the best. So uh, to go back to the Amazon versus the grocery store example, we expect Amazon we, even though we know only Amazon is giving that to us, I mean, other companies now are catching up, but for the longest time, it was only Amazon that was giving us that smooth, seamless online buying experience. And now you'll see everybody else is starting to do it because we expect it. We expect it from our local grocery store. We expect it from Kohl's. We expect it from the places that we physically shop at. We expect there to be a really significant digital component as well. Uh, we're talking with Janet Tierney, who's a UWO alum and also uh, a strategy consultant. She works with companies of varying sizes from the largest to the smallest to help them uh, with their digital strategies and other ways to better perform. One company in particular that uh, sort of set the bar for everyone, and that was Amazon when years ago they decided they wanted to be this digital online supermarket. And I remember reading that and thinking, that's, that's, that's an interesting concept. I don't know how, how well that's going to take off, but it did. Mm -hmm. Now, did it take off, do you think, because that's what people wanted, uh, that's what people got, or because of something else? Why do you think that took off like it did? There is an interesting thread um, that connects all of the companies that we look to and go, wow. Why didn't I think of that? I mean, we think about what Amazon is doing. We were already buying things. We were already selling things. Amazon connected the people to the people doing the selling and the sellers to the people doing the buying. You look at Uber, another company, major market disruptor. They didn't create a product. They connected people who needed a ride to people who were willing to give them a ride. And they connected people willing to give rides to people who needed them. 
Airbnb is another example. People owned homes and were renting them out for, for anyone coming to vacation in their area. But it was very difficult to know how to connect to those people. And if you were a person who was willing to rent out your home, it was very difficult to find someone willing to rent your, rent your space. So Airbnb built a platform that connected those people. So I think that the real opportunity in technology, whether you currently have a business, whether you're currently a consumer looking to the market to provide something for you, is that technology that, that helps the people like me who have no patience, who can, that connects sellers to buyers, that connects users to providers. That's really the thread of where technology is going. And if you're a company and you're providing services or goods, if you're not connecting with your customer, watch out for that disruptor who will. Now, this technology, and you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, how technology is moving faster than we can keep up with it. And that can be intimidating to some people, uh, even to companies. Some who would just say, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I don't mess around with that. I, I you know, I'd re I just, just give me a telephone and I'm okay. How do we get everybody to recognize the importance and get over that hump, I guess, of learning how to use technology and, and accepting it. I like to make it fun. So start with something that's fun. Uh, Facebook is fun and that's why people do it. Not because it's technology, but because of what it's giving us. It's giving us the opportunity, particularly in COVID, to make human connections. Or in this time where we were all moving to disparate areas, it's giving us the opportunity to stay connected. Um, if you can't make it fun, remind yourself you already use technology. You are already an expert. Um, when, we scheduled, so? when we scheduled this meeting today, it went on my Outlook calendar. You probably put it on your calendar. You're already a technology user. When you made a phone call this morning, you are using a cell phone. You are already a, an expert at using your cell phone. We have so much knowledge that we have just from interacting with the technology on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't even think about anymore. That the barrier or the, the barrier to learning the next new thing is not as high as we perceive it to be. If I can use my, my cell phone to make a phone call, it wasn't a very big jump to use my cell phone to play music. If I can use it to play music, it's not a very big jump to use my cell phone to look up something like, where's the closest good restaurant? So we know more than we think we do, and, um, and it really is fun. So, Janet, tell us about what tantalizingly good stuff may be awaiting us around the corner. What great ideas have you – I mean, you don't have to – give patent secrets away. I'm not asking yeah. for that, but are there new and exciting things on the horizon that you've heard about? And what kind of areas are we talking about? Yeah. You know, every once in a while, I get the opportunity to be in the room for some really fascinating conversations. Uh, one, a little bit unrelated to what we've been talking about so far, is what we can do with fossil fuels. Now, the conversation is all around how do we go from fossil fuels to, you know, from our, our gas-powered engine in our vehicle to an electric car. Fantastic. I, I want a really cool electric car just like everyone else. Whether or not I can afford it, another mm -hmm. conversation for another show. What, the, what some of the energy, typical traditional fossil fuel companies are discovering is that they already have technology in place that with minor modifications can actually solve some of the problems created by fossil fuel usage. And when you look at a gas reservoir, there's, there's what we think of as oil in the bottom. And above it, in that pocket, there, is, there are gases that are keeping pressure on that oil. Traditionally, when we've punched a hole into that bubble, into that, that space, we've released the gases to get to the oil, to get to the crude, to get to the thing that we want. Well, we, we found out at one point that natural gas, we, that's good, we want that. But we're releasing a lot of other things to the air. Once there's no longer positive pressure in a reservoir, it's no longer cost effective to remove its contents. Companies will cap, the, cap off their wellhead mm -hmm. and they'll move on. They'll go to try to find the next location where we might find the energy resources we need. And what companies are now starting to experiment with and being highly successful with is technology that allows them to capture not only the gases that they're releasing, but also 
get greenhouse gases that we are creating, driving our gas-powered vehicles, operating our coal-powered energy plants for, you know, charging your cell phone in your, in your electrical outlet, they're discovering that they can recapture that from the atmosphere using a lot of existing technology, pump it back into the reservoir, keep that positive pressure longer, which means that they can they don't have to go find and exploit new resources. And I use that word specifically exploit because we've seen the environmental de degradation that often accompanies going after these resources. So now we can get more energy out of the same resources for a longer period of time. We can operate the tools we are accustomed to having. I already own a car with a gas burning engine. I already get probably coal fired electricity to the electrical outlet in my wall. Um, we can do that and clean up the environment at the same time. Now that's not to say we shouldn't all look forward to having mm -hmm. more fuel efficient vehicles, more energy efficient devices as we, as we lean in and embrace technology. But for someone like me who is concerned about the world and the environment, for all of us who should be, who are probably, it's, it's an opportunity for us to say the runway is not as short as we believe it to be. I believe in our lifetime we will all be driving electric cars. But it's nice to know that, it, that delaying it right now is not causing necessarily irreversible damage to the planet. That's an exciting technology. And the, the fact that they may be able to recapture those harmful emissions and gases that's something to be um to be encouraged by yeah. i think yeah so that's a, that is something uh, fantastic i remember you know thinking the other day when i looked at my phone how far the cell phone mobile phone has come from this big block that uh, existed in the 80s to where it is now which is more of uh, a little computer that you carry around with you you think that's going to continue to be how we uh, operate? I think it is. I think you're going to see more and more functionality on the devices that we carry around. And that functionality really is going to come from our willingness to carry it. So for a while, cell phones were getting smaller. Mm -hmm. Now cell phones are getting a little bit bigger. <laughs> yeah. right? For a while, iPads were getting bigger. And then they came out with the iPad mini and, and other tablets have followed suit. The mini, a little bit bigger than a phone, right? So our willingness to carry that technology around in our pocket or in our hand or in our bag really is what's going to drive additional tools being made available to us. Same thing with laptops. I remember the first laptop that I borrowed here at UW Oshkosh to go to a Model United Nations competition was heavy. It weighed more than my luggage, I think. Wow. And now I think about the laptops that I was carrying a few years ago. They were feather light. And now the laptops that I carry are heavy again. We're going through that cycle of, I want more battery life out of my laptop so I can use it longer. I sacrifice, I accept that it's going to be a heavier piece of equipment. So the more we utilize technology, the more advances we're going to see. Wow. You got an exciting job, don't you? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I genuinely love what I do. Yeah. You get to be in the room with all the smart guys and ladies and, and figure out where we're going and help them get there. And we thank you so much for coming by and talking to us today. It's really been nice meeting you and having this conversation. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, that's all the time we're going to have here today. You've been watching and listening to UWO Now. I'm Wendell Ray. Until the next time, have a good day.